Hello. So for this lecture, what I want to do is tackle talking about blood vessels and then hemodynamics, which is the flow of blood through the blood vessels. I like starting out with this particular picture here. This is a picture that was done by Leonardo da Vinci um, during the late 14, early 1500s. And uh, he basically did major dissections. 30 di He dissected over 30 people. And uh, what was so amazing about Leonardo da Vinci is that uh, oftentimes, as you can see over here, this is the vascular tree. He would basically relate these things to other things that you would see in nature, which is here's a seed with, you know, branches that were coming out and roots that were coming down. So, you know, the blood vessels do branch, and uh, there are many things in nature that branch. It's a common pattern that we see. And Leonardo da Vinci, way a long time ago, figured a lot of those things out. <clears throat> he was a great anatomist and, and did sketches of blood vessels in all body parts, really. So we'll start out by talking about blood vessels. There are three types of blood vessels that you're probably familiar with. The arteries are going to be the um, the blood vessels that are going to um, let me get my pen right. The blood vessels that are going to be carrying blood away from the heart, and they typically do that under high pressure. Um, the smallest of the arteries is going to be considered to be an arteriole, and uh, they're going to connect in with these things called capillaries. So these are under high pressure. If you cut them with a knife or cut them in an accident, they, they are going to spurt and squirt far away. When you cut an artery, it's very dangerous. Capillaries are going to be um, in between the arteries and the veins, and they're going to connect arteries and veins. So they consist only of a single layer of, um, of simple squamous um, um, epithelial cells known as endothelial cells. So those are going to be the capillaries. The veins are going to carry blood back to the heart, and they're going to be under, um, not under very high blood pressure. So if you cut a vein, it kind of oozes. You know, if you cut a capillary on your skin, it kind of creates a little oozing, um, you know, bruise-like effect. Um, but the smallest of the veins are called venules. And, uh, again, if you cut these, they ooze, and, and uh, they're not as dangerous as if you cut an artery because they're not under high blood pressure. Just kind of showing you how the vascular system is set up. Uh, you probably know this already, but the heart is a, is a pumping organ, and it's going to pump uh, blood into arteries. The first arteries that we are going to pump blood into are called elastic arteries. They have a, the ability to spring and stretch. We then are going to go through a series of muscular arteries, and then the, um, the various arteries are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until they terminate into arterioles. So we will have a terminal arteriole that will feed or go directly into a capillary bed. So you can see that they're basically going into capillary beds here, here, and here. So um, uh, we can control the flow of blood into capillary beds with these little with these little precapillary sphincters. These are little smooth muscle tissues. Once the blood though flows to the capillary bed, it's in capillaries. And uh, you have tons and tons and tons of capillaries because that's the place at which um, all of your tissues are fed by the blood that's in the capillary. Oxygen diffuses across the, the simple squamous epithelial cells, goes to your body, so do nutrients, water, and then gases will come back, like carbon dioxide, will come back into the bloodstream at the capillary beds. Everywhere you have a body part, you have a capillary bed. These are very, very common. They're the most common blood vessels that there are. Sometimes you have a, a, you know, a direct connection between arteries and veins. So that happens uh, ever so likely, ever, ever so uh, often. Uh, and then, of course, after you go through the capillaries, you get to a venule, and then you'll get to small veins, medium-sized veins, and eventually large veins that will flow the blood back to the heart. Now, if I take the ink off the slide, you can see right here that when fluid and, and, uh, and nutrients and things go out of the capillaries, there is a whole other uh, series of vessels that can actually absorb that fluid. One of those, well, the, the um, other set of, of, uh, of vessels are called lymphatic vessels. 
and uh, basically they drain fluids in the body, so it's a whole parallel series of vessels uh, separate from the arteries, veins, and capillaries. They don't carry blood, they carry fluid, and uh, so all the fluids that bathe the body will go through these lymphatic vessels. They'll go to lymph nodes, which are little filters that help to filter out bacteria and cancer cells and things of that nature, and eventually after the fluid's gone through several lymph nodes, it goes through the lymph vessels, eventually all that fluid is dumped back into the venous circulation. Okay, so um, so that's just a little bit about the lymphatic vessels. We'll actually have a, a, a whole lecture on the lymphatic system, and we'll talk about lymph vessels a little bit more specifically. So in general, your blood vessels are going to have three layers. Of course, capillaries are not because they're only one layer thick, but uh, when you look at arteries and veins, they generally you're going to have about three layers. So the tunica interna, or tunica, uh, tunica intima, um, is going to be the innermost layer. It's adjacent to the lumen or the, the actual tube part where blood is sitting and it's made of simple squamous epithelial tissue surrounded by a layer of connective tissue. Of course there is a basement membrane there and then there's a little bit of connective tissue um, the, underneath of that. The middle layer is called the tunica media and uh, it's made of smooth muscle tissue and elastic fibers. And then the tunica externa is the outermost layer and it's made of a connective tissue sheath. And this is what those things look like. I'm going to show you several different pictures. I like the way artists have done it in different uh, pictures. So in this particular picture you can see the tunica intima or tunica interna and uh, you have your simple squamous epithelial cells so they're only one cell layer thick. It's also called the endothelium because it's inside, it's a layer inside. And you can see the lumen is the actual tube part, the hollow tube part of this uh, vessel. There is a basement membrane, all epithelial tissues, if you remember, sit on basement membranes. And then there is some connective tissue underneath of that, or on top of that, um, which is going to be made of uh, elastic materials. And uh, you can see uh, there's a contrast here between the artery and the vein. You can look at the difference in the thicknesses of those particular tissues. So in the tunica media, the tunica media is that middle layer. You have smooth muscle tissue, so less in a vein, more in an artery. That smooth muscle tissue uh, can be controlled by the sympathetic nervous system um, to tighten down or to uh, relax, and we'll talk about vasoconstriction and vasodilation a little bit later in this lecture. So the tunica, uh, the ex uh, beyond the tunica media, there uh, is also another external elastic layer of connective tissue, and then we get into the tunica externa, which is your last layer of connective tissue. Notice in veins you have valves. These are little flaps of the endothelial or epithelial uh, simple squamous cells, and those little flaps allow blood to go in a one direct, one way direction. When blood flows back this way, that that valve will, or little flap will close, thus preventing the flow of blood backwards. So if we look at the capillary down here below, the capillary has a basement membrane. There's of course the lumen, and then you have a simple layer of uh, simple squamous, you have one layer of simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so those are your thinnest blood vessels in the body. Uh, I kind of like this picture, uh, it just gives you kind of a different view of it, but uh, I like this picture because it shows the capillaries being connected to the arteries and veins here, but it also shows you that the tunica externa it does have elastic fibers, it has collagen fibers, and there's uh, and there's basically there's blood vessels inside of that. A lot of people don't realize that an artery or a vein is an organ, and organs have to be fed by blood vessels. So there's literally blood vessels that go to that, that particular layer, the tunica externa, and they're going to feed the muscle tissue nutrients. The blood can't flow nutrients but so far through this particular layer. A lot of times it doesn't even go through that. So we have to have a blood supply that feeds the artery so that it can maintain its health. There are nerves there as well, um, so in that tunica externa, so that you can sense any kind of damage to that particular vessel. So arteries carry blood away from the heart uh, to the tissues of the body. Um, the walls of the arteries are elastic. That allows them to absorb pressure. So when you are uh, basically when the ventricles contract, they're exerting a tremendous pressure on the fluids that are inside of them. And so once that fluid is ejected out of the heart, there has to be an absorption of that pressure. So the vessels that are immediately out of coming out of the heart absorb that pressure 
and then you know once the heart relaxes that pressure can be used to continue the pressure squirting um, blood through all the uh, arteries of the body okay so so um, they do absorb that pressure because they have smooth muscle tissue in the tunica media arteries can regulate their diameter remember diameter if I just look right diameter is this is this this uh, uh, crossway through the center of a circle so that diameter uh, can be stimulated to dilate or to contract the sympathetic nervous system will be controlling that particular thing that particular activity vasoconstriction is the constriction of an artery so that it narrows so you get in so if this is what the artery looks like after vasoconstriction it looks more narrow and a narrow artery uh, if, if it's forcing blood through, a narrow artery is going to send blood or raise the pressure of blood and be able to send it in a further direction. Vasodilation is the relaxation of the of the uh, smooth muscle tissue, so you go back to having a uh, a larger diameter, and that's going to decrease the pressure um, that blood is being exerted on the blood. So there are elastic arteries. These are also known as conducting arteries. They have a very large diameter. They're very elastic. They have less smooth muscle tissue than other arteries we'll talk about. And they function as pressure reservoirs. So these pressure reservoirs, like I said before, um, you know, when, and I'll go ahead and show you a picture now, but uh, here is, uh, is the, um, is the art uh, is the heart when it's contracting so we have ventricular systole here so as the left ventricle contracts the blood's being sent through the aorta the aorta is a an elastic artery so you can see the walls of the artery are expanding because of the pressure that's um that's coming through and then once the um the left ventricle is in diastole it's relaxing the recoil will help to pour, force blood back through a little bit more so you don't get just an initial shock of blood going through, but you also get the recoil. So it aids in, in helping to maintain pressure um, uh, after the ventricle has contracted. So those are pressure reservoirs. So another type of, ar of artery later, uh, uh, further downstream are considered to be distributing arteries. And these are just arteries that are going to distribute blood through all, all the body. They have a relatively medium diameter, much more smooth muscle tissue, fewer elastic fibers. So they have a little different job than the elastic arteries have. They distribute blood to all the parts of the body. And they will eventually connect to the arterioles. Arterioles are known as resistance arteries. They're uh, basically numerous. They go to all the parts of your body and they are going to connect with capillary beds. Typically they have a diameter of 30 microns or less and they're poor, they have a very poorly defined tunica externa being so uh, thin. They connect larger arteries to capillary beds. So they're pretty important um, at connecting the uh, muscular arteries to the uh, to the capillaries. So we then get to capillaries. The capillaries are microscopic vessels that usually connect um, arterioles and venules. <clears throat> the capillary walls are composed of a single layer of cells, and they also have a basement membrane that's porous. Because their walls are so thin, capillaries will permit the exchange of nutrients and wastes between the blood and tissues. So that's their job that they serve is being uh, a means by which you can feed your tissues of your body and get rid of their waste products. And this is what a capillary looks like. You can see the lumen is the is the place is the is the uh, is the hollow space that the that the um, the single layer cells creates, and the basement membrane covers that. All epithelial tissues by definition sit on a basement membrane. So this is kind of what uh, a capillary looks like. There's connective tissue around it, embedding it in. in. We have uh, red blood cells moving through the capillaries. So you can see the lumen or the, the tube through which the blood's moving through. We have the single layer of cells right here. And you can see the cap, uh, excuse me, the, the nuclei of those, um, of those cells making up the walls of the of the um, the capillary and there are three types of capillaries based on the job that they perform so the first type is the uh, most numerous and it's called the continuous capillary this is found you know in your skin and muscle as examples of locations and you can see there's a blood vessel the bl uh, red blood cell fitting through the the lumen or cavity we have the uh, the endothelial cells the simple squamous cells 
and uh, you can see the nuclei of the single uh, squamous cells. In this particular capillary, we have a tight junction, so the membranes are fused together to allow very little uh, material to flow out. And, uh, you know, um, many of the blood vessels in the brain have tight junctions, and they create that blood-brain barrier, almost being impenetrable to, um, to fluids in between the cells. So in a fenestrated capillary, we have um, um, uh, pores. As you can see, there are pores that the, uh, the endothelial cells are creating, and that allows for great permeability. So um, jo uh, places where you would expect to see this particular, um, this particular type of capillary would be the kidney, where you're doing a lot of absorbing and filtration of the blood, and then the small intestine, where you're doing a lot of absorption of materials. So these would be places where you would see those particular things. So if a, if a tissue or an organ is active in absorption or filtration, uh, then you would see these fenestrated capillaries. So it serves the purpose of the job they need to perform. And then we have the sinusoid capillary. These are found mostly in things like your liver, bone marrow, and spleen. And these are the most permeable of the capillaries. As you can see, there are uh, large um, what they call intercellular clefts or spaces that uh, that large materials can actually fit through and slide out of. Typically, we're going to keep red blood cells in, but there are things that can squeeze in and out. Uh, large things, maybe even dead um, blood cells, can squeeze out of these. And uh, you know, the liver is a great filter of the body, so sinusoids is a is a place where they can do their job things can leak out of the capillaries and then the liver cells can actually digest those materials. Same thing with bone marrow. Um, you know, you have a lot of things being created that need to squeeze out and uh, the spleen is a filter as well. So everywhere that you go in your body, you will be able to see capillaries. They're just the most common thing in the human body. So everywhere you have cells that have to be fed, they have to be near capillaries so they can get the, the uh, water and uh, the nutrients that come out of the capillaries. And so we have here, um, we'll, we'll look on the left-hand side, the uh, arteries, and then the right-hand side, we'll look at the veins, and then the in-between, we'll look at how the arteries' veins are connected together. So here we have uh, a pair of arteries, collateral arteries, that are kind of merging in to form an arteriole. Notice all that smooth muscle tissue there. If I can track that down, I can stop the flow of blood going through there. Or I can, you know, if I can track it down just a little bit, I can increase the blood pressure. So those, uh, those smooth muscle cells have a, a, a great job of controlling the flow of blood into um, into the um, capillaries. So we have here the capillaries. You can see they're one single layer thick and they're numerous. So all the cells are being fed by those capillaries. All these cells are being fed. All these cells are being fed. So capillary beds are really super important. Then you can see the blood's coming through into a small vein and then it's exiting out through a venule. So that's kind of the flow that goes through here. Now sometimes if we want to, uh, for example, if, our, if our, our great dog is chasing you like a Rottweiler or a pit bull and it's about to eat you, we can contract all of these, excuse me, not there, let me get my ink off. So we can contract, if something's chasing you or something's threatening you, we can contract, let me go back and get my pen ready. So we can go back and we can um, contract these these uh, sphincters right here, stopping the flow of blood so that we block blood going to the capillary bed and it goes straight through this little thoroughfare straight to the veins. So in some areas like the muscle, like, excuse me, the stomach, you know, we may not want these, these, you know, there's no reason to digest food if we're about to be eaten by a Rottweiler. So we can basically take and shut the flow of blood off to the capillary bed, use one of these thorough these thoroughfares or thorough, yeah, thoroughfare channels and then shunt blood directly to the venous system so we can take it really to more vital uh, things like the muscle tissue and uh, the nervous tissue. So if we look at this particular picture here, we can see that uh, this terminal arteriole has blood coming in and uh, we have these pre uh, pre-sphincter uh, capillaries and uh, we have the ability to send blood all through the capillary bed but during emergency situations 
we can take and cut off those pre cap those pre sphincter capillaries. So if I can go back and get my so if we take and uh we could take and shut those pre -cap capillary sphincters, clamp them down, send blood directly to the vein, so we can then block these capillary beds that are feeding, you know, um, things that are not life um, that are needed for for emergency situations like digestion of food. So we can shuttle the blood to the um, muscle tissue, and that's what it looks like when they close down. So you basically, you have a thoroughfare there that carries blood directly to the vein. Now, you know, there is a way that you can test for capillary uh, the capillaries are working. So you can see this person here is taking their finger and pressing on another person's uh, uh, the end of their fingers is turning white as you can see. So that's pushing blood out of the capillary beds. Once you release, normally the capillary bed should fill back up and bring that pink coloration back to underneath the fingernail. So um, you know, anytime you find a person with a broken bone, you can take toes or fingers, if they have a broken arm or leg, you can take toes or fingers and press on those to see if the capillaries are refilling or not. If they're not refilling, that could mean that an artery downstream could have been severed and thus um, that could be a problem for the person. They could be internally bleeding to death. If you find a person that's on, you know, that's laying on the ground and you push on these capillary beds and they don't fill up, that could mean that they don't have any circulation. So that would be a bad um, symptom. So venules and veins. Venules are the smallest veins, which have the job of collecting blood from the capillaries. And then veins are formed from the union of several venules. So veins range in size from medium to large. And uh, they each will vary slightly in their composition of the tunica media and the tunica externa. Veins contain a very important thing called valves. Valves are these little flaps of the, of the squamous tissue inside of the vein. And these little uh, valves will help to um, keep the blood flow going in a one-way direction. So you can see blood can flow in this direction through the valves. But if you take and put pressure this way, the flaps of those little epithelial cells will close, thus protecting the blood or preventing it from backflowing. And so you can see over here on, the, uh, on this left-hand side, the valve is closed, the valve is closed, but the muscle is relaxed. Here, if we take and stand on our toes, we can contract that, uh, that uh, gastrocnemius muscle there. It puts pressure on the fluids inside of the vein. So if it goes backwards, the valve closes, but the pressure going this way allows the valve to open. Thus, the blood flows through, but blood going that way will close that valve down. So it's good to exercise. Probably the reason why when you exercise, you, uh, you uh, have a larger number of heartbeats is because you're sending more blood back there. Um, so that's what's good about exercise or one of the good benefits of exercise is you get your blood flowing and it's flowing back to the heart faster. So at any given time there's more blood in veins than there are in all the other blood vessels. So veins act as blood reservoirs. It's a place where you can store blood, large volumes of it. Uh, veins can accommodate large changes in blood volume by stretching or recoiling. So um, so if we need more blood, then we do have smooth muscle tissue in the veins that can be contracted, and we can tighten those up and send more blood back to systemic circulation. So in order for blood to flow, there has to be blood pressure, and this blood pressure has to overcome what we call peripheral resistance. Okay, so we do create a blood pressure. The heart generates that blood pressure. And uh, whatever that pressure is, it has to be greater than all of the resistance created through, um, through the rest of the body, through the, through the uh, blood vessels in the rest of the body. So blood pressure is generated by the contraction of the left ventricle of the heart. And uh, the arterial pressure that is at the start of the aorta, right after it comes out of the heart, is somewhere about 120 millimeters of mercury. Okay, that's an average reading um, in a person that's not really exercising. And uh, it uh, basically, this pressure, once it goes through the uh, 
the elastic arteries, the muscular arteries, the arterioles, it'll eventually get to about 35 millimeters of mercury at the start of a capillary bed. So a lot of pressure is lost by the time it gets to a capillary bed. Capillary hydrostatic pressure is going to be at the beginning of the capillary bed, there's going to be about 35 millimeters of mercury. That is the pressure at the start of the capillary bed. And then 18 millimeters of mercury is going to be the pressure at the end of the capillary bed. And generally speaking, venous pressure probably averages out to about 18 millimeters of mercury. So you can see that veins are under very low pressure, capillaries are under uh, low pressure, but arteries are under uh, very high pressure. So the uh, entire systemic circuit um, pressure averages about 100 millimeters of mercury. Now, so we have pressure, but we also have resistance to that pressure. So the resistance, uh, the total peripheral resistance is resistance of the flow of blood, and there's many factors that create this resistance. So we have vascular resistance. This is, these are the forces that oppose blood flow in the blood vessels. So things like friction between the blood, uh, the actual blood cells and the wall, uh, the vessel walls. So long vessels, uh, of course, there's going to be more friction that the blood cells will pass by. The diameter of blood vessels can also increase or decrease that friction. So if it's vasoconstricted, it increases friction. Vasodilated blood vessels are going to decrease the friction. So there is friction between the elements in the blood and the, the actual walls of the blood vessel. So another thing that creates vascular resistance would be blood viscosity. So um, uh, the lower the viscosity, that is the amount of materials that are dissolved in it and how syrupy the blood is, if you have a really low viscous, mostly water type of liquid, um, this has lower friction. But if you take and you lose a lot of, of uh, water in your blood and there's a lot more proteins and, um, and blood cells, um, um, in that particular fluid, then you can have a high viscosity liquid and that will increase the friction. And then friction is also generated by the flow of blood over irregular surfaces or past changes in vessel, uh, vessel luminal diameter. So the lumen, the diameter of the lumen, um, you know, whenever you have changes in that, that will actually cause turbulence. And anything that's irregular like plaque, you know, inside the blood vessels, um, that could create turbulence as well, which increases friction. Increasing friction increases the resistance. So um, these little irregular areas and and ch and changes in the um, the luminal diameter, these will in these will basically create little eddies and little swirls, which creates friction. So this is just a, 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 a little graphic showing you some of the things we just talked about. For example. You can see um, this particular vessel right here. It's going to um, it's going to basically be shorter. Therefore, there's less resistance to the flow. So resistance they're using as just an arbitrary unit of one. Flow is one, but you increase the the uh, length of it, and uh, the internal area increases significantly. And this is going to add resistance and reduce flow. So if you can see the diameter, you know, at the center of, uh, of a blood vessel, you have the, the least resistance. And then at the edge of it, you have the greatest resistance. So if you have a greater diameter, there's going to be less resistance than a smaller diameter because of these properties to this. And that's what this graphic down here is showing you. So greater diameter, greater flow. Uh, smaller diameter, the flow is going to be reduced. So resistance is going to be uh, significant. And then down here we have a little bit about turbulence. So here we have a fat deposit or a plaque deposit. And you can see the flow's coming in nice and easily. Once it hits that little deposit though, you get little whirls and little eddies that form. And that thus creates resistance. So this is a little graphic that's really important for you to understand. We have the x-axis down here is going to represent the um, the aorta, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then the largest blood vessel, the largest vein, the vena cava. So here we have total centimeters uh, of area in uh, centimeters squared. Then we have the velocity. If you notice, the total area of the 
um, of the uh, arteries, the aorta, and the arterioles is relatively minimal. When we get to the capillary bed, though, we have huge amounts of area because every part of the body has to be fed by, uh, by capillaries. So we have huge number of capillaries. And then once we get down into veins, we have very low numbers of veins in terms of, of the literal um, uh, surface area. So um, the velocity, as you notice, let me go back. So the velocity, as you notice, will um, will is very, very, very high where you have very low area of the arteries and the aorta. Okay, so very a, a lot of blood is being forced through a very small area. That's like putting your your finger over the 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 outflow of a of a hose. If you take and narrow the area, it increases the pressure. If you take and, and take your thumb away, it decreases the pressure, thus it decreases the velocity coming out of it. So if you notice going into the capillary bed where there's a lot of area, there's a decrease in velocity because sending blood through all those capillary beds, it increases resistance, it increases the area it has to go through, thus the velocity or the speed of the blood is decreasing. And as you go to, to narrower and narrower and smaller um, surface areas of our total area of um, of veins, the pressure will increase slightly because there's less resistance. So blood pressure is mostly associated with the uh, arteries. It is the force of blood being exerted on the walls of the blood vessels and it's felt as a pulse at certain points on the body. So our systolic pressure, if you look at blood pressure, you know you can have 120 over 80, it seems to be the, uh, the average. The top number is going to be your systolic pressure. That's the maximum pressure that occurs at, at the height of ventricular uh, contraction. And then you have your diastolic pressure. This is the pressure that's exerted on the walls of the, um, of the arteries when you have um, right before the next ventricular um, contraction. So it's the lowest pressure that occurs right before the uh, next contraction. To learn how to take blood pressure is not too terribly hard. There is a video right there you can take a look at. Many different nice videos are online for you to look at as to how to take a blood pressure. But just to kind of talk about it real quickly, so um, measuring a, the arterial blood pressure is a really important uh, a tool that, uh, that uh, medical personnel use to see uh, your overall health. So blood pressure is going to uh, basically be taken from the uh, brachial artery. This is an artery that's located right here in your upper arm. And what they do is they take a blood pressure cuff. They take a blood pressure cuff and uh, and it has an air bladder inside of it. So you can take, and there is a little valve right there that you can decrease the pressure inside of that air bladder, or you can increase the pressure by cutting it off and not allowing any, any air to flow out. So if I take and push that pressure bulb right there, I can press air into the air bladder. And once the air bladder gets tight enough, it'll actually stop the flow of blood. You can see the stop, the stopping of the flow of blood through that brachial artery. So, um, I can actually take and release that pressure and, uh, and uh, that blood pressure cuff. Once I release the pressure and the pressure is low enough the blood starts flowing through, that's going to be my first number that is going to be um, the top number of my blood pressure reading. So that will be the systolic pressure. Um, you can hear that with a stethoscope. So you'll listen for that blood to start flowing through. And, uh, and then once you stop hearing the flow of blood altogether, that's going to be the lowest number. And, uh, and that will be, um, and this particular person, 120 over 70 is their blood pressure. Again, it's a skill that you do better by not looking at a simple picture like this, but by watching a video or actually practicing it yourself. And again, these are average numbers. This, you know, different, your left and right arm will have different blood pressures. And blood pressure will vary throughout the day. So blood pressure is going to be influenced by many different factors. The amount of blood volume that you have will, uh, will influence blood pressure. Your heart rate will influence blood pressure. And the amount of blood being ejected out of the heart will, will influence blood pressure. But so will your blood viscosity. That is, if you have really a lot of water in your blood or very little water in your blood. And then the peripheral resistance um, will, is, is going to influence blood pressure. 
And just one more time showing you that blood pressure is going to be highest in the aorta and then it's going to diminish to its lowest level in the vena cava. So the further and further I get away from the heart, the lower and lower the blood pressure is going to be. Of course you can see that these are just contractions of the heart. So we have systole and diastole. So you can see the contractions of the heart there. But on average the mean pressure, you can see that going through the aorta arteries and arterioles. There are pulse points that you can feel all over the human body um, and these are important to know where they're located so that you can uh, feel um, if a person is uh, has lost the flow of blood to a particular body part. Probably some of the ones we mostly use would be the common carotid artery there on the side of the neck. The brachial artery is really important at using for blood pressure. The femoral artery is really important as well. Um, to see if blood is flowing to the legs. And of course, the dorsal pedis artery would be one I would feel if a person had a broken leg up here. The dorsal pedis would be one I would feel to make sure or ensure that uh, that broken bone, wherever it is, hasn't severed a blood vessel and thus um, caused uh, internal bleeding and lack of blood flowing to the lower parts of the leg. All right, so we'll move on and talking a little bit about capillary exchange. So diffusion is the net movement of ions or molecules from the area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So this is how capillaries exchange materials from the inside to the outside to the tissues. One of the major ways is through the process called diffusion. These are how your gases will move across and, other, and some other ions. So filtration is the pressure-driven movement of fluids from the capillary to the um, to the tissues of the body. This pressure driven movement is made by blood hydrostatic pressure. So literally it's the blood pressure that's going into the capillary bed that's going to move those fluids and solutes from the capillaries into the interstitial fluid that's bathing all the tissues of the body. Now large molecules, plasma proteins, these uh, are very large and they will stay inside the capillary, um, especially if it's a continuous capillary. So those fenestrated capillaries, you know, they can release some proteins uh, if you have a lot of high blood pressure, but typically those things will stay inside. Sinusoids, not so much. So reabsorption is the pressure-driven movement of fluid and solutes from the interstitial fluid into blood capillaries. And this pressure-driven reabsorption, reabsorption is, is made, made by blood colloid osmotic pressure. So inside of a blood vessel, there are dissolved materials. Typically, those dissolved materials, all these little dissolved materials and proteins and things of that nature, uh, are pretty high inside of the capillary. And... They're pretty low in interstitial fluid, so, so the pressure-driven movement of materials from the interstitial fluid to the capillary is going to be driven because of the pressure that's exerted because you have basically lots of materials that are dissolved in here, very few materials in the, in the, in the um, tissue fluid. So there is a pressure that fluid wants to move to an area where there's greater solute. Okay, and that uh, basically is called blood colloid osmotic pressure. And it's a physical pressure. It can be measured in millimeters of mercury. So if we take a look at this graphic here, you can see here the arteriole, and we have the venule, and then we have the capillary bed. So what this is basically showing you is, uh, is net filtration. So at the beginning of the capillary bed, where you have the greatest um, hydrostatic pressure, or, or capillary hydrostatic pressure, you can actually measure it in millimeters of mercury. So here we have a, a measurement of 35 millimeters of hydrostatic blood hydrostatic pressure. And uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure is going to be about 25 millimeters of mercury. We notice 35 is greater than 25, so we have a net filtration uh, that is stuff being squirted into the interstitial fluid of positive 10. Wherever you have a positive number, blood is flowing out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid. Well, as we get further down, though, from the capillary, you notice that uh, the, um, 
that the osmotic pressure, the blood osmotic pressure, excuse me, the blood hydrostatic pressure is diminishing. It goes from 35 to 18 millimeters of mercury. So, but blood, blood colloid osmotic pressure stays at 25 millimeters of mercury. So here you have net filtration is minus 7, which means that there's going to be some fluid that's going to move from the interstitial fluid to the, to the plasma of the blood or into the capillary. Okay, so we have basically the, uh, the movements of these fluids is based on um, either the um, hydrostatic pressure being greater than blood colloid osmotic, excuse me, blood hydrostatic pressure is going to be greater than colloid osmotic pressure, blood colloid osmotic pressure. Fluid's going to go this way. If I diminish, diminish, diminish the hydrostatic pressure but increase the, or, or, or have the blood os, uh, colloid osmotic pressure greater than then the hydrostatic pressure, blood's going to come into the capillary. I had the error wrong right here. So if hydrostatic pressure is greater than os colloid osmotic pressure, blood goes this way, or fluid goes this way. Fluid's going to come in this way if um, hydrostatic pressure is less than colloid osmotic pressure. Now, when you get uh, some weirdness in these, in this, uh, or some upset imbalance in these pressures, you can get what we call edema. Edema is an abnormal accumulation of the interstitial fluid, and this can be caused by high arterial or venous blood pressure, failure of the heart, liver, or kidney. Starvation can also cause edema as well because the liver in, in starvation, the liver is not getting enough of the proteins that it needs, so it cannot produce enough of the blood proteins. So your blood colloid osmotic pressure is going to decline, thus hydrostatic pressure is going to stay the it's going to stay the same and it's going to force fluids into the tissues of your body. This is what it looks like during starvation. These kids aren't fat from uh, from obesity, but they are derived, they're deprived of protein, thus their liver doesn't make the proteins that they need to maintain blood colloid osmotic pressure. Therefore, fluid accumulates in their belly and makes them look obese, but they're not. It's just fluid that's inside of that. This is what edema looks like. So here's a normal leg. Here's a leg that has edema. And there is a special kind of edema called um, it's it's a it's a symptom of elephantiasis and elephantiasis is a is a um, condition where you um, basically um, have been bitten by a mosquito and it's been it, it has transmitted a larvae of a filaria worm into your body and what it does is it block blocks the lymphatic vessels from draining the fluids of your body and when those lymphatic vessels are blocked then you have major edema and your your body blows up into large um, proportions. Okay, so I think I'll stop there for this particular lecture. That's a nice little chunk. And then in our next part, we'll talk about the control of uh, fluids uh, in the blood vessels and then talk about actual blood vessels. So until next time, I will see you later.